It's lovely to be down with you again in Valley Halbert, and we do make you all welcome in the Lord's name. I was coming up from Balamina Kalibaki, which is the centre of the universe, of course. And uh, when I left Kalibaki, it was stormy, but I can tell you it was much worse when I hit the Ards Peninsula. Uh, I said to some of the fellows in the prayer meeting just before the service that uh, they're forecasting 70 mile per hour gales on the coast and 60 miles inland. So Liam gave me some good advice. He says, then don't stay on the coast. <laughs> so the minute I get down to Bali, Walter, I can assure you, I'll be heading inland for the 60 mile an hour gales and not the 70 mile an hour ones. So it's lovely to be here. We got here safely and we're looking to the Lord to take us home safely once again. So we're going to read from the Word of God. If you have your New Testament with you, we're reading from John's Gospel. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you in a moment or two why we're going to be speaking on the subject that I've chosen for tonight. But we're reading uh, a quite longish passage. And as I say sometimes, reading the Word of God is more important than anything that I can say. It's amazing. God has promised to bless his own word. He hasn't promised to bless one word that I will say about his word. So he has promised to bless the reading of his own word. So we're going to read from John's Gospel, chapter 19, and we're reading from verse 16. Then delivered, this is Pilate, was delivering the Lord Jesus, he, him, therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called Golgotha, the place of a skull, where they crucified him, and two other with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read, Many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified, was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek, and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, and gave up the ghost. The Jews therefore, because it was the preparation, that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was on high day, besought Pilate, that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bare record and his record is true and he knoweth that he saith true that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. And we know that God will bless this longish reading from his 
precious word. Now, before I say anything about it, we're going to have a short word of prayer. Father, we come just to acknowledge in your presence our total, absolute dependency upon the help of your gracious Holy Spirit. It is our desire tonight, our earnest desire, to magnify and to uplift and glorify the name of our Lord Jesus. And so, Father, we pray that you will help us to do this very self-same thing. We know that that is your desire as well, that he will be magnified and have the preeminence in all things. And so we pray you will give the needed help. If there's someone here tonight and they don't know him, then we pray that they might come even this evening and put their trust in him. And those of us who know and love the Lord Jesus, we pray that our hearts will be strangely stirred again this evening as we think of all that he has done for us and all that he means to us. These things we ask in his precious name. Amen. Why am I going to preach on what I'm going to preach on this evening? I haven't told you yet what I'm going to preach on, but I'm going to tell you why. <clears throat> I've been reading through John's Gospel. This is a wonderful Gospel at home. It's not like the synoptics. It's different completely. I believe when we read through John's Gospel, we come very much aware that, God, that Paul, John is writing to a very wide audience. He's writing to the world. He'll explain words that no Jew would have needed to explain to him. Uh, the word Rabboni, master, or that the Passover was a feast of the Jews. And yet he tells us these things in the gospel because he's writing mainly for a Gentile audience. He's writing for the likes of you and me. His gospel is interesting because he only records eight miracles. He doesn't even call them miracles. He calls them simeon in the Greek or signs, starting with the changing of the water into wine in chapter 2 until we get to chapter 1, the eighth sign, that miraculous draft of fishes. Eight signs are recorded for us in John's gospel. So as I have read through it afresh, I have been thrilled as I have looked at these things over and over again. The whole Bible is really about the Lord Jesus. You remember the Lord Jesus speaking to the Pharisees? He said to them, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The whole Bible is a testimony to the person and the glory and the work of the Lord Jesus. I can remember being down here one evening and I spoke to you about the Old Testament scriptures. And the message of the Old Testament scriptures is, he comes right from Eden's gate. It was proclaimed that one would come who would bruise the serpent's head. And of course, it was speaking prophetically of the coming into the world of the Lord Jesus. The prophets foretold it. They told much of what was to happen, including where he would be born, how he would enter Jerusalem on the donkey, and much of the sufferings that he would endure were recorded and prophesied by the Old Testament prophets. And so the message of the Old Testament is simple. He comes. But the message of the Gospels when we come into the New Testament is this. He dies. Every one of the Gospels end up and give more space to the death of the Lord Jesus than they do to anything else. This is the great message of the Gospels. He dies. Then we come to the Acts of the Apostles. The message in the Acts of the Apostles is he lives. Over and over again, you will come across this phrase. God raised him from the dead. If Christ's death is the payment for our sin, then his resurrection is the receipt. God raised him from the dead to prove that all that he had done was accepted and had satisfied the claims of the outraged throne of God. <coughs> then we have 21 epistles. And the message of those 21 epistles is this. 
He saves. Some of them were written to individuals. Some were written to collective companies of believers. But they were all people that God had saved by his marvelous, amazing grace. And the message of those 21 epistles is this. He saves. And then, of course, we come to Revelation. And the great message of Revelation is this. He reigns. The Lord Jesus is coming back again to reign. If you can remember those things, it will help you in an understanding of the Bible. It's all about him. He comes. He dies. He lives. He saves. He reigns. But when I came to the end of the gospel, as I was reading through it with Sandra, I was very much touched again by these chapters relating to the death of our Lord Jesus. There are three words here I want to spend the rest of the evening speaking about. Three words that he uttered in his dying moments on Calvary. There are seven sayings. I have heard men who spoke on the seven sayings of the cross. I only want to speak for a moment or two this evening on one of those sayings. This shout that he made just before he died. It is finished. In the Aramaic, it's one word. Tetelestia. It just means done. Finished. Completed. And that's what the Lord Jesus cried before he died on the cross. This passage is very special to me. About four years ago, I was taking a service in a church near Portadown. And after the service was over, I went home. And about 11 o'clock that evening, the phone rang. And it was a lady who had come to the meeting with her little boy. He was 10 years old. I had spoke on this very self-same subject that I'm going to speak to you about tonight. And she said, Paul, I have something to tell you. She said, James, that was the little boy's name. She said, he come home tonight in an awful state. Speaking about all that Jesus had suffered on the cross. She said, I couldn't get him to settle, to go to bed. And she said, just half an hour ago, he trusted Christ as a savior. Here's what she said. She said, I don't believe he'll ever be the same again. And I said to her, I hope he never will. I'm hoping there's someone in this little gathering tonight, after they hear what I have to say, and after the Holy Spirit we trust takes what I say and implies it to your heart, I hope you'll never be the same again. I hope you'll understand the wonderful message of the gospel in such a real way that if you're not saved, then you will come tonight and trust Jesus, whom to know is life eternal. It is finished. I think it's always wise, and I always say this at the beginning of my remarks on this subject, to note what he did not say. He did not cry, I am finished. That would have meant defeat. Those are not the words that came from his mouth. He did not say, I am finished. Mind you, there were those standing around the cross, the priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees, who would have been delighted if an absolute humiliation and defeat he had cried, I am finished. But those are not the words he cried. I want you also to note he didn't ask a question. He didn't say, is it finished? You know, the Lord Jesus knew why he had come into the world. He said on one occasion, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish the work. The writer to the Hebrews reminds us in chapter 12 that he's not only the author of faith, he's the finisher of faith. 
He had come to finish the work that the Father had given him to do. There was absolutely no doubt in his mind that everything that was needed for our salvation had been fully done when he cried, it is finished. I'm also glad to say he didn't cry, you are finished. <coughs> Mind you, you would almost say it would have been justified when you think of the torments and the punishment that the Lord Jesus had endured at the hands of puny men. Do I need to remind you this evening that though his hands were attached to that cross by Roman nails, that there was omnipotent power in his fingertips? Did I remind you of that? He said to his disciples, I could pray to my father, and he would send 12 legions of angels. If the Lord Jesus had cried for help, from that cross, the heavens would have opened. The angels of God would have descended. And every one of his persecutors would have been lost. But then so would we. Because no salvation would have been provided. And we would have been left with absolutely no hope for eternity. So I'm glad that he didn't cry from the cross. You are finished. His cry was simple. It was a definite cry. There was no doubt in his mind. He was absolutely sure. He cried with a loud voice. This was not the cry of a vanquished sufferer. This was the cry of a triumphant conqueror. He cried, it is finished. Everything that was needed was fully done. So what was finished? I'm going to suggest a few things to you that I have no doubt were finished when the Lord Jesus expired on Calvary. First of all, I'm going to suggest this. His sufferings were finished. Isaiah said prophetically that he would be a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. I was just looking at the little baby tonight. I was just thinking when into the prayer room. The moment the Lord Jesus came into our world and breathed in our tainted air for the first time, suffering for him began. He had come from the unsullied atmosphere of heaven to even breathe our poisoned air. Must have been suffering enough. But to live in Nazareth and to be brought up in a town where he was misunderstood and misrepresented. What suffering that must have been as he listened to the gossip of him being the illegitimate son of Mary. How awful it must have been for him. Then to have went to Calvary and to have suffered first of all at the hands of those led by Pilate and Herod the king, to have been scourged, to have been spit upon, to have had his beard ripped from his cheeks, to have his back lacerated to such an extent that it resembled a ploughed field, to be taken outside at nine o'clock in the morning, and to be nailed hands and feet to a cross and uplifted as a spectacle, the most ignominious of all deaths, only a criminal suffered this way. And yet the Lord Jesus despised the shame. And he endured it all, even up to the death of the cross, just so that you and I might be saved. But I need you to understand more than that. I have said this so many times. I sometimes fear that it's repetitive, but it must be said. You've got to understand this if you want to become a Christian. You've got to understand that the sufferings that he endured at the hands of men would never have saved one of us. Those sufferings only show us the hatred 
and the wickedness and the sinfulness of the heart of man. But Isaiah the prophet makes it clear. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when he shall make his soul an offering for sin. The sufferings that the Lord Jesus endured at the hands of God when the darkness descended at 12 noon and when he was all alone and cut off and abandoned from heaven. And God, in some miraculous way that we will never fully understand, made to meet upon him the tidal flow of our sins. And the Lord Jesus opened his bosom to that stroke of divine justice. It would have sunk every one of us deep in the lake of fire forever. And the Lord Jesus endured it for a sinful race. And so became our hiding place. But when he cried, it is finished. His sufferings were over. The hymn writer put it like this. Ne'er again shall God Jehovah smite the shepherd with the sword. Ne'er again shall cruel sinners set at naught our glorious Lord. Do you know it was Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus who took him down from the cross? On holy hands were never again allowed to touch the Lord Jesus. They lovingly wrapped him in the clean linen and put in the spices hurriedly because the Sabbath was coming on. They laid him in that new tomb. But on holy hands never again touched the person and never will touch the person. Of our wonderful Savior. His sufferings. Were over. But there's something else. Not only. Were his sufferings over. But the sacrifices. Which had been offered. Under Jewish law. Were finished. You know I know the size of these boys. I can remember sitting. In gospel meetings as a boy. And. Hearing the preachers talking about the lambs and the bullocks that had been offered in sacrifice in Jewish law. And, you know, to a young mind it seemed so awful that these animals were all being slain and being killed. But the writer of the Hebrews reminds us that those sacrifices offered under Jewish law could never take away sin. You might say, well, what was the purpose? It was like a picture book. God was trying to teach us by picture form. Those sacrifices were never meant to take away sin. They were only pictures and patterns and shadows of a much greater sacrifice that was to take place in a coming day. Any intelligent Jew who would have brought his sacrifice to be offered... And so the blood being shed must have walked away realizing the blood of an animal cannot atone for my guilt. It could never remove it completely. The Bible makes it clear. Those sacrifices were only a covering. They all awaited the coming into the world of our Lord Jesus when he atoned by his precious blood for human guilt. But the sacrifices could never, ever take away sin. The writer to the Hebrews tells us this. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of God. The high priest could never sit down. Those sacrifices were repeated day in and day out, continually. But the Lord Jesus, by his one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down. The sacrifices were over. The shadows, the types had served their part. But now the substance had come. And there was no need for the shadows any longer. Jesus had died. And that once and for all sacrifice for sin had been made. A remarkable thing happened that day. We're told that the veil 
in the temple. I should say many remarkable things happened that day. I'm only focusing on one, but this particular instance shows us that the sacrifices were finished. The veil in the temple, that thick veil, Josephus says it was a hand's breadth, about six inches thick. It was ripped from the top to the bottom in the midst. Not from the bottom to the top now, the top to the bottom. It was rent by a divine hand. It separated the holy place from the holiest of all, into which the high priest could only enter once a year and not without blood. But God was signifying by that divine action in rending that veil in twain that the way now into his presence had been opened up for all mankind. You see, you can be saved tonight. I could be saved and was saved many years ago, not because of any good in me, not because of any merit that I had or any good works that I had attained to. I'm saved solely through what Jesus accomplished on that cross. There's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. Maybe you feel it in your heart tonight. Maybe you're not saved. You feel that burden of sin and you would love to be rid of it. I'm telling you, there's a way back to God tonight. But at Calvary's cross, that's where you begin. When you come as a sinner to Jesus. The veil was rent in twain. And the way into God's presence was now made manifest. Horatius Bonner, a minister and a hymn writer of a bygone day, he wrote these wonderful words. No blood, no altar now. The sacrifice is o'er. No smoke, no flame ascends on high. The lamb is slain no more. You might say, but why? And he answers it. For richer blood has flowed from nobler veins. To purge the soul from guilt and cleanse the red stains. No need for any more sacrifices. The once for all sacrifice of the Lord Jesus has been made. And the way into God's presence through the rent veil of his flesh has been opened up for us. We have nothing to do. We have nothing to pay. All has been done. All we do is come. And put our total confidence and trust in him for salvation. His sufferings were finished. The sacrifices offered under Jewish law were finished. The scriptural prophecies relating to his life and death were finished. Now I have to say there are many prophecies still awaiting fulfillment. But all the prophecies relating to his life and death were finished the moment he cried tetelestia from the cross. John wants to underline that for us. He tells us of scriptures that were fulfilled. For instance, he tells us of the soldiers who had crucified the Lord Jesus. They say there was a quaternion, four soldiers, who nailed the Lord Jesus to the cross. They had divided his garments into four parts, but they had come to that inner garment, that tunic. It was without seam, probably woven on the loom of his mother in Nazareth. And they said, let us not rend it, but we'll gamble for it. Whose it shall be? Those were heathen Roman soldiers. They knew nothing about the Old Testament scriptures. And underneath the cross, the Lord Jesus watching them, they gambled for his inner raiment, fulfilling the words of prophetic scripture. Upon my vesture did they cast lots. And John says, these things therefore the soldiers did. He also tells us that, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he cried, I thirst. Notice that, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he cried, I thirst. The Lord Jesus knew. Not very many minutes after that, 
He would just commend himself into the hands of God. He would bow his head and give up the ghost. He knew that. But that the scripture might be fulfilled. He knew there was a little scripture, one of the Psalms, a verse in it, that had to be literally fulfilled. And so he cried, I thirst. And they set a vessel full of vinegar. They put it upon hyssop and they reached it up to his mouth. And when he had received it, he cried, it is finished. What was the little verse that needed fulfillment? They gave me gall for my meat. And in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. And the Lord Jesus knew that scripture had to be fulfilled. And so he cried, I thirst. And the minute the vinegar reached his lips, he cried, it is finished. Every single verse relating to and every single prophecy dealing with his life and death had been absolutely and totally fulfilled. Even when he died, they came and they broke the legs of the first and of the other that was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, he was dead already. And they break not his legs. One of the soldiers with a spear, he thrust it into his side and forthwith there came out blood and water. But listen to John. Why would he tell us those details? That the scripture might be fulfilled. No bone of him shall be broken. Do you know the Paschal Lamb, Exodus 12? One of the specifications was that no bone of that little lamb was to be broken. I'm sure the Jews, as they celebrated the Passover down through the centuries, they must have wondered, why has no bone of the Paschal lamb to be broken? It all becomes clear here, doesn't it? It was one of those prophetic fulfillments. No bone of him shall be broken. And then that soldier with the spear that pierced his side. There's another scripture says. They shall look on him whom they pierced. I'll take a little aside for a moment. I'm watching the clock. God has not yet finished with the Jewish nation. At this minute, we are told by Hosea, that they are in a position of being not his people. Lo am I. You can read about that when you go home. But Hosea promises that there will come a moment when he will say to them, you are my people, and they will say, you are our God. You can read about the fulfillment of that in Zechariah chapter 13. An awful lot has still to happen. My, we look over to the Middle East today. We can see the nations already taking sides. We'd be blind if we couldn't see it. And the Lord Jesus, though he had died, when that spear was thrust into his side, was still fulfilling prophetic scripture. They shall look on him whom they pierced. Two-thirds of the nation of Israel have yet to face their greatest holocaust. Only one third will survive. Isaiah 11 says that God will stretch out his hand the second time to, re to redeem the rest, the remnant of his people that are left from the four corners of the earth. He'll call them back. And Paul tells us in Romans chapter 11, when the deliverer comes out of Zion, all Israel, that's not the complete nation, that's the remnant, that's all that are left, shall be saved. And the prophetic word was this, they shall look on him whom they pierced. It will dawn on them and God will give them the spirit of supplication and the spirit of revelation. And they'll realize that what their forefathers done was wrong, that Jesus was their Messiah. They made a mistake. And they will cry out, the Lord is our God. And he will bring them back to himself. And he will say, you are my people. Am I? He'll bring them back into that place of covenant relationship. 
again. All of those scriptural prophecies were fulfilled that day. They were all made, not yet fulfilled some of them, but they were all mentioned that day when Jesus died by John in his gospel. Some await fulfillment, some were literally fulfilled when he died. But the scriptural prophecies concerning his life and his death are finished. Here's the most important thing for us tonight. This is the last point. The work, the work of salvation is finished. I've got to tell you that God did raise him from the dead. I'm not just presenting to you tonight some man that died on a cross that's lying, rotting away in some tomb in Palestine. I'm preaching to you one who came from heaven's dizzy heights down into our world. He was the immortal one. And in some miraculous way, he took upon him human flesh and died on that cross for sinners. And God has raised him from the dead. And he sits tonight in the power of an endless life at the Father's right hand. And he's going to come back again. But the work of salvation, as far as we are concerned, is finished. I often think about some of the great painters. I was thinking the other day about Michelangelo who spent so much time lying on his back painting the Sistine Chapel. My wife said to me, she said likely if he hadn't done it they would likely have put him to death anyway. So he likely had to do it whether he wanted to or not. I was thinking about Leonardo da Vinci and the Mona Lisa putting the last brush strokes to that portrait and he stands back and he says, finished, finished. Or Michelangelo working at the marble and he gets the chisel and he chips away the last few chips of that masterpiece that he's making. And when those last chips of marble fall to the ground, he looks at it and he says, finished. It's complete. It's done. The Lord Jesus was hanging on the cross. And from that vantage point, he could see the whole panorama of salvation stretching out before him. He knew that every I had been dotted. He knew that every T had been stroked. He knew that every throb, every pang, every pain. He knew that every piece of separation and abandonment had been endured. And as he looks at the whole thing, that masterpiece, he cried. It is finished. Isn't it terrible that people today are still trying to work for salvation? Isn't it? What an insult to the finished work of the Lord Jesus. The hymn writer said, lay your deadly doing down, down at Jesus' feet. Everything is fully done. Everything's complete. It is finished. Yes, indeed, Finished every jot, sinner, this is all you need, tell me, is it not? If you're here tonight and you don't as yet know the Lord Jesus, I hope you'll be that, like that little boy four years ago who sat in that meeting outside Portadown. I hope you'll never be the same again. I hope this will impact your life to such an extent that you can do nothing else, moved by the Spirit of God, only to trust Him. That's all He wants you to do. And then He wants you to live your life totally, absolutely, fully for Him. I'm not standing here tonight trying to tell you that I have never made any mistakes. I have made many. I wouldn't like you to know about all the mistakes that I have made even in my Christian life. But I have a heavenly father and a loving savior who has forgiven me for every one of them. And I'm saying this in all honesty to you tonight. Whatever time the Lord has left for me to live, I want to live it for his glory. I hope you're the same. 
I hope you want to live to please him and bring glory to his wonderful name. If you haven't started on that journey as yet, you know, there's such potential here. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, only God knows what you could be for him. Only God knew what Saul of Tarsus could be. He was to become Paul the Apostle. Only God would know what Jacob could be. He would be Israel, a prince with God. Only God can see the potential in any one of us. Whenever God saved a preacher in a past day who was totally illiterate, Someone wondered, what could God do with a man like that? One day speaking to him, he made this confession. He said, I have only one thing going for me. He said, I love the Lord Jesus with all my heart. Do you know God used that man to the salvation of thousands? I mean thousands of precious souls. And the world has yet to see. What God can do with one man or one woman, totally, absolutely devoted to him. Why not come tonight if you're not saved? Take that first step on the journey and receive him right now to be your savior. May God bless his word. Thanks, Paul.